I was going to give a lengthy introduction explaining where Gabriel came from and where he's going to. And, um, and then I look around the room and I realize that, that everybody knows the importance of IOPA, everybody knows the effectiveness of Gabriel Bernardino since he's... Uh, he, and he, he must be effective because he got <laughs> renewed exactly, for a second yeah, term. Yeah. Um, for my sins, yes. But... Uh, <laughs> Even though you came from Portugal, I mean, we on the on the peri on the Atlantic periphery of, of Europe, we sometimes can make the breakthrough into. into oh yeah, Gabriel, it's a, it's a, an honor and, and a pleasure to have you here, and I'm not going to say anything more and ask you to proceed to tell us what you want to tell us about insurance and insurance regulation in Europe. Very good. Well, thanks a lot. You can stand up or sit down, whichever no, you like. I can I can stand up. Thanks a lot, uh, Patrick, and thanks thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really. Always a pleasure to be in here and, and to be in Dublin, of course, I was telling Patrick. This is a, a place where you, uh, you, know, you smell professionalism in insurance. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very good to, to definitely be in here. There's someone that likes, of course, otherwise I, I wouldn't be doing this. I like, <laughs> like insurance and pensions, of course. No, I will, the presentation on today, I'll put a couple of slides and just to try to explain you a little bit where where are we and what are we doing in this uh, in in a number of areas and of course uh, the the title there is related to systemic risk but i'm i'm going to talk a little bit more beyond uh, systemic risk i think that's important to uh, understand what is um, what is going on right now from a, from a, a micro and a macro supervisory uh, perspective and uh, how do we believe that uh, we should complete the framework that uh, that uh, that we started with, of course, the development of uh, of Solvency II um, a number of years ago. So, just uh, um, a couple of elements, if I can go back uh, first on systemic risk and the macro potential policy. So, to explain a little bit our views in this area, which is an area that have been, uh, of course, dealt with uh, also internationally and uh, and where there is a lot of, I would say, evolution. Uh, then recovery resolution, some points about insurance guarantee schemes, and of course, uh, uh, happy to, to have questions afterwards. So in terms of um, systemic risk and macro prudential policy, you know, we have been, of course, um, in the insurance sector, uh, confronted with uh, all the discussions about too big to fail and about systemic risk uh, in the sequence of the crisis. And uh, what it was obvious was that, uh, you know, at the, in the banking side, there was a lot of uh, already uh, literature, research, discussion, uh, definitions, understanding. In the insurance sector, that was definitely not the case. So we, we, we entered in all this, uh, I would say, uh, post-crisis uh, uh, scenario with, uh, I would definitely uh, say, a, a lack of uh, an overall narrative about uh, what is uh, what is systemic risk in insurance what that what does it mean and and this element related to macroprudential policy and so after a number of years where definitely uh, internationally also there's there was a need to deliver something and something was delivered you know there was a creation of uh, global systemic uh, uh, insurers with uh, i would say a number of good things being developed there but we also believed uh, at AOPA that we would need to take a little bit of a step back and think about uh, what do we have in Europe and how can we, uh, how can we have a proper discussion, more insurance-based uh, in these areas. And that's, that's what we have done um, with the publication of these three papers. Uh, first one where we pose ourselves uh, the question, does insurance create or amplify systemic risk? A second one where we looked at... Uh, the tools that we had already in place. So do we have already in place in our regulatory framework, basically insolvency to already tools to deal with that? And thirdly, you know, are other tools needed? Um, is this sufficient what we have? If not, if we are not covering everything, what can we uh, and should we uh, devise? And so these were the three topics that we had uh, on the, in this area. And we, um, you know, we, we published a number of papers on, on, on this. And now we are... Uh, at a stage where we are trying to put uh, more meat to the bones in terms of the concepts of uh, the last part of it uh, with other pro other potential tools, this has evolved, uh, uh, of course. And right now, I'm quite happy also that uh, not only uh, I think 
the idea that we had that this should be part of the solvency to review uh, uh, is, is there, definitely. Also from the Commission side, I think that after uh, some reluctance uh, during uh, some, uh, some time, uh, uh, I think they recognized that, and this is part of the call for advice that they gave us for the, 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 the review of Solvency II for 2020. I will not go in too much uh, detail on this. This is very complex, but just to explain you a little bit what was the mindset from our side. So we really tried to look at insurance from a perspective of you know, what are the activities and what are the risks that really, uh, uh, you know, deliver or can be originators of uh, systemic risk. And so this element of looking at the risk profile of the companies for us was always the point of departure. And then, of course, to look at what kind of sources we, we could have that could prompt, uh, 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 you know, the amplification or the creation of systemic risk. And we created this kind of framework uh, uh, where we have entity-based sources, so linked, of course, to the individual company and the, you know, the failure that you can have of a company due to this, this business model and these activities. Activity-based sources, which, of course, uh, with, will, you will have activities that have a greater potential to, uh, to derive systemic risk. And finally, something that we also uh, uh, wanted to cover, which is what we call a behavior-based sources, which it's not related to one company individually or one group, but uh, collectively. Uh, uh, for example, you know, if, if a group of companies that have a, a similar type of business model very much dependent on interest rates, uh, on the interest rates, for example, is that the case that collectively they will do the same thing in a certain point in time and this could create or amplify systemic risk? So this is basically... The, the, the kind of framework that we had, and of course, uh, um, we developed it and we tried to have a good narrative around this. The important point in here is that, uh, and that's a big part of what we published, is that every time we, uh, we looked at deeply, of course, we found some situations and some activities where insurers can create systemic risk, but most of the times was that they can amplify systemic risk due to the interconnectedness, of course, that insurers have either through their investment policy in the financial markets, etc. So amplification being, I would say, a much, uh, a much bigger point. Then, in terms of sources, so I just uh, mentioned that entity-based, the activity-based and the behavior-based, uh, really important was to understand uh, you know, the, the, what should be the operational objectives that we should have <laughs> with any kind of systemic risk framework or macro potential framework. And these were the, the, the objectives that we defined since the beginning. And I think that that's particularly important because if you look at them, this is where you start to see that there are some differences in relation to what is the, the usual construction and thinking on the banking side. You know, it's to ensure a sufficient loss absorbing capacity and reserving. And in here, of course, we all know insurance it's usually about uh, the, the reserving, you know, uh, 80, 85 percent of a balance sheet of a company is in there. So this is fundamental to understand the potential and the, the, uh, for, for amplification of systemic risk. Secondly, to discourage excessive involvement in certain products of activities. And again, that's what we have saw, that there were certain types of products and certain types of activities that were really, really prone to uh, uh, the possibility to create or amplify systemic risk. So one objective of the framework should be to have tools to discourage that excessive uh, involvement, then to discourage also excessive levels of uh, uh, exposures and concentrations, and this is a very important element because if we look back at uh, many failures in the insurance side, very often it's about this, it's about concentrations, mainly on the investment side, uh, and this is something that, of course, needed to be uh, dealt with also in a macro in a macro basis. You know, when you see, for example, we'll not go in details, but when you see in certain country, countries the huge home buyers in terms of owning of sovereign debt that you have also in the insurance sector, this is something where, of course, from a macro uh, perspective and the pot potential amplification of systemic risk, this needs to be captured also in the insurance in the insurance sector. And finally, of course, limit procyclicality because especially in a, in, in a risk-based regime like Solvency II, we know that 
some of the measures of, uh, of capital insolvency will be inherently procyclical in some ways during, of course, depending on the cycle. So how can we ensure that we have tools to capture that uh, and limit that procyclicality and finally discourage uh, a risky behavior, a normal one? So these really operational objectives very, very important from our side. Um, some of the elements uh, of the tools that are already in place. And that was something that uh, was also interesting uh, to develop because when we, when we put in place and when we develop uh, Solvency 2, and it took us 15 years, uh, we are always, of course, focused on, on micro-supervision. That that's the essence of Solvency 2. But, of course, as we were developing a risk-based regime uh, with these elements of volatility, etc., we created a number of tools that have a macro prudential uh, impact at the end of the day. And so we, uh, we analyze this very deeply. And, and, and there's a number of uh, elements already in the regime, be it, be it in pillar one and with uh, you know, volatility adjustment, matching adjustment, etc. Recovery periods, which are, of course, powers of the supervisors to, uh, to, to take in terms of uh, crisis situations. Also, some, uh, some uh, situations of prohibition or restriction of certain types of activities. So the regime has already a number of tools that have a direct uh, macro prudential impact. But then are other tools needed, and are especially some areas where we um, definitely need more. And the conclusion was uh, quite clear that, uh, especially in areas related to, for example, liquidity, uh, we need more. Uh, because, of course, different business models in insurance uh, have different elements in terms of liquidity, of course. We, we need, uh, that's what we believe, some more enhanced reporting and monitoring in that area. And also we need some intervention powers in terms of um, situations where really the manifestation of, of uh, systemic, potential systemic risk is really heading up. And uh, things like, for example, uh, having a capital add-on uh, that is possible today with the Solvency II regime, but specifically when we see that there is potential for amplification of, uh, of, of systemic risk. There were other tools that we considered, but that we didn't believe from our side that they would be well adapted to, to, uh, to a, a regime like Solvency II. For example, the you know, traditional countercyclical cap capital buffer that you have in the banking side, we believe that that doesn't make so much sense in a construction like, uh, like Solvency II. But um, definitely things like uh, recovery plans and resolution plans, this preemptive planning to be ready um, if something happened. And so in, in a preventive way, we believe that this would be a, a fundamental point in, a, in this kind of macro prudential regime there. So this is what we have uh, done until now. We have been working since this, of course, and um, we're putting meat to the bones on these uh, other types of tools and we will consult it in a couple of uh, months' time. And we want to integrate this in the discussion of the, the review of Solvency II. A little bit about recovery and resolution. What is the situation right now in Europe? You know, the situation is clear. It's a patchwork. You know, you don't find two countries that have the same regime. You know, uh, some countries have already developed some recovery and resolution regimes. Uh, some have been more inspired from the banking side. Others created uh, somehow uh, uh, different approaches. Many countries don't have anything. And especially what concerns me, and we have seen situations in, in real life, is that there's many situations where the supervisors don't have the proper tools to deal with the situations. So either they basically, uh, you know, they kick the can down the road, well, there's other names for these things, of course. Uh, I don't want to use the word forbearance, but uh, yeah, sometimes is, uh, we see that. Yeah, we need to take actions, but there's always the, you know, let's see if this works a little bit. Uh, or, because, because what? Because the only alternative that they have is liquidation, is the winding up directive that exists, that is, of course, uh, in, the, in the framework. There needs to be, of course, and there are tools that can be used in between. We have, of course, uh, uh, you know, the portfolio transfers that are used in many of these situations, which, are, which is a tool that works and that can be used and it should be used. So we're not departing from scratch, but we need to have a minimum harmonization of this regime throughout Europe. And uh, what, we have, uh, what we have done was really to try to look at what should be the minimum content of this uh, recovery and resolution uh, policy. 
we we sent an opinion to the European institutions um, already uh, uh, in 2017, I believe. Uh, um, we had some uh, reaction from the Commission, but uh, not so enthusiastic at that point in time. But uh, now I think that uh, at least they are getting, uh, I would say, more serious in this area. And uh, we received now a real concrete call for advice to work on this also um, in, the, in the context of the Solvency to Review. Just to let you know a little bit on... Um, oh, I'm going back... Um, on what we have in there, just the building blocks, so the normal building blocks of uh, recovery resolution, so we didn't invent any wheels in here. Preparation, planning, early intervention, re recovery resolution, and of course cooperation and coordination between supervisors. The recovery we didn't need to because we had already in Solvency 2 a framework for, for recovery, and so ladder, the Solvency 2 led intervention is, is already there. In terms of the particular elements, of course, very importantly, and, and, and this is the message, uh, and because I hear sometimes uh, the, some industry uh, colleagues telling, ah, but Solvency 2 already deals with this, we have recovery plans. Yes, we have, but it's post. It's when things already are uh, on the wrong side of the road. That's not what we want in here. It's preemptive. It's to have, of course, the, the possibility uh, to have companies doing uh, these, um, these assessments of recovery and, uh, and resolution. And let me be very conc conc concrete and clear in here. The last point, proportionality. That's what we mentioned in there. Uh, we, we don't intend to have a regime of, uh, of recovery and resolution that is across the board to all, all, all the companies in the same way. Personally, I believe that recovery plans is, should be part of, of a sound risk management. You, know, you do your own risk assessment, YORSA, having a recovery plan is just a natural extension of that. You know, what, what am I going to do if things go wrong? You, know, you look at different states of the world in the future, what am I going to do? You know, what I'm, what, how am I going to do? Uh, uh, what kind of actions am I going to take? That's good business practice. Now, of course, Bigger institutions, they are more complex. They will need to have it, of course, much more detailed and complex. Smaller institutions, they are smaller. They have less risks. They will do it much more simpler. So proportionality is in there. In terms of resolution, I believe that really resolution planning and uh, re resolvability assessments should be more focused on the real bigger, bigger groups, bigger companies, the ones that have a lot of complexity of business, also cross-border, etc. So I think proportionality should uh, should work in here. Early intervention: we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want we have solvency two. Solvency two has triggers, has already definitions in there. So we don't have uh, uh, any intention to defer to define other hard early intervention triggers. What we want is to make sure that there is a logic and a sequencing that. Uh, the supervisors will have sufficient information to start to monitor uh, what happens in the companies when, of course, you're approaching to, um, to breach a, a, an SCR and then from there to have, of course, convergence of, uh, of practic practices on how to do this. And this is very important huh? because, let me be very honest, uh, today we have already in some countries some of these limits uh, already defined. There are some supervisors that said already, you know, when you're approaching 130%, uh, you need to say this and this and that, and we need to harmonize this throughout Europe uh, in the internal market. Resolution, of course, the normal things, designation of, an, uh, of a resolution authority, but a lot of flexibility in there because we believe that this is inherently different also from, uh, from banking, so we could definitely have different uh, possibilities of choice of the authority to define very well the objectives of resolution. And in here, I think it's very important because contrary to the banking, where, of course, the focus is on financial stability, and rightly so, understandably, the way that we look at recovery and resolution is it's to balance much more the principle of stability, but also definitely uh, policy of the protection. So this is linked then with a number of uh, uh, you know, resolution powers, for example, where we say that, uh, of course, you know, the, the resolution authority should have the power to, um, to bail-in creditors. There should be a last ratio power of bail-in policyholders only if you know, all the other possibilities you know, uh, don't deliver uh, a, better, a better treatment. So this issue of uh, having a balance between the objectives of policyholder protection and financial stability is very, 
it's very important. The rest, of course, it's the natural things, you know, uh, the exercise of powers, of course, needs to be uh, within a strong framework and uh, strong safeguards, etc., etc. Just to say, for example, the situation. I know a country uh, in Europe that where there is the power from the supervisor to bail in policyholders, but it doesn't have the power to bail in creditors. It is, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have logic. So we really need to uh, take care to have a, a good, good convergence in this. And finally, of course, cross-border cooperation coordination, setting up of crisis management groups, all those kinds of things which are already normal, normal practice. So just to say that what we are proposing is not a copy-paste of the banking regime. What we are proposing is to have a minimum framework of harmonization that you know, could work within a single market where all the supervisors um, will have similar powers and similar tools and all the companies will be treated in a, in a similar way in a, in a level playing field, which is not what we have right now in this, in this area. What about guarantee schemes to finalize? Well, the situation in there, it's even worse, I would say, because you know, we have now, I think, the latest number that we had, that we published, we have, I think, 18 countries that have guarantee schemes. So you see already a good number of them that don't have anything. On top of that, there's huge disparity uh, on the ones that have it in between you know, the scope uh, some have only for life, others have only for non-life, others have for two uh, different types of uh, uh, schemes, uh, different types of institutions. You know, Some are, are guarantee schemes properly, others are companies that have been set up uh, within arrangements. Coverage is also very different uh, limits, uh, you know, type of, uh, of course, of coverage. The funding, completely different. Some are completely, uh, you know, ex post, others have ex ante elements also in there. And also the functions themselves, you know, some, some uh, are integrated with the motor guarantee funds, others are completely separated. There's, you know, it's, it's definitely a patchwork right now. So it's huge fragmentation. And my strong point is that this really creates huge problems, not only in terms of the logic of having, uh, uh, you know, consistency and convergence and, and having all the European citizens at the end of the day uh, having the same level of protection throughout, uh, throughout the internal market. But definitely, uh, when we see the cross-border business, this creates a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems. And this is something that I believe, you know, in the past, we, I remember to write a letter to the Commission in 2009, I was still SEOPS, I believe, leading, uh, raising this issue that this created issues uh, in the internal market because of cross-border. We didn't have huge evidence at that point in time because, of course, we're still in Solvency One. We, we didn't have the, the, uh, the, the framework that we have today. Fortunately or unfortunately, today we have evidence. We have clear evidence that this doesn't work. And uh, so what we have been doing is, uh, you know, we, we really decided at our board to touch upon this, and uh, Sylvia knows it was not uh, easy, that, because, of course, this is an area where there is a lot of... Um, What's the word that I can use? Skepticism. That's a good word. Um, but you understand. So um, we started really uh, looking at this. We have a special, uh, special group looking at uh, the area of uh, insurance guarantee schemes. We've done, of course, a stock take exercise and in-depth analysis of the pros and the cons of harmonization. We tried, of course, to be fair, to put all the points there. But definitely, you know, our view, and uh, this, I hope that we can proceed with that, is to to, to have a, a, an harmonized approach to, to insurance guarantee schemes throughout Europe, a minimum harmonization, at least in terms of some of the elements that I mentioned there, you know, in terms of the scope, in terms of the coverage, in terms of, uh, you know, minimally, I would say, in terms of funding also, to make sure that we can at least close this hole that exists in the internal market for uh, the protection of, uh, of consumers. We published a discussion paper last year. We're, uh, we're now working on... Uh, uh, you know, hopefully an opinion that we can uh, that we can publish um, in March. We will have a good discussion, uh, I would say, in terms of the way ahead. And I'm 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 quite uh, I'm I'm quite positive still that we can we can get there. But um, really, the evidence I think it's it's clear. You know, just a couple of these are public data, so I'm not uh, saying anything that I shouldn't. 
but there has been a number of failures, and actually some of them impacted in your market. You, you, you should know the names very well. You know, in 2014, Setanta, a company coming from Malta, approximately 75,000 policyholders, mainly here in Ireland, cross-border, no Maltese insurance guarantee scheme, and uh, you had all these issues in relation to the way that your guarantee fund would, of course, be protecting these, and uh, the, the, was, uh, the rules were amended, of course, to cover for third-party damages. A big case uh, uh, between Romania and Hungary in 2015, uh, Astra, which was the market leader in Romania, that um, after a balance sheet review that AOPA made there, we found that um, they were not very well. Um, so they went in liquidation. It was a big market leader, huh? uh, a lot uh, of cross-border also in Hungary. And in here, it was the complete opposite because the Hungarian customers, they were double protect. They were having double protection because they were covered by the home fund of Romania, but they also had were covered by the Hungarian fund, which was, it shows that this is really you know, not consistent. Huh? Finally, uh, an agreement was, uh, was reached between the two uh, funds, but this was really uh, also a critical situation. Then um, other, other situations. Gable Insurance from uh, Liechtenstein in 2016, 130,000 policy orders, some of them in here, but not so big, I, if I remember. But again, the same thing, no Liechtenstein insurance guarantee scheme, a few national solutions. Uh, the Danish had to... Uh, changed their guarantee fund to, to cover the losses in Denmark, for example. So again, another repercussion. And finally, more recently, uh, two Danish companies, uh, uh, Alpha and Kudus, uh, both of them with business in, in Ireland, but in many other countries throughout Europe. Good number of policyholders, you know, 1 million, 200,000 in Kudus uh, situation. And uh, in the first one, um, the Danish insurance guarantee scheme covered, according to the rules, of course, uh, there. Um, and in relation to, to kudos, uh, it was a very delicate situation because uh, the Danish authorities decided to change uh, uh, the scope of the guarantee fund and that from the 1st of January this year doesn't cover anymore the business of, uh, outside of Denmark. So you can imagine the, um, that it was touchy at the end of uh, 2018. A lot of engagement that it was possible that, uh, you know, uh, bankruptcy was declared in the last days of 2018 and then, you know, the fund still covered the clients throughout Europe, including here in Ireland. So you see that, what do we need more? You know, this is clear evidence that the framework that we have right now doesn't work. You may say, ah, why do you put this in a presentation on systemic risk? Yeah, my friends, this is, I believe, a systemic risk because it's not that the companies are the biggest companies in Europe. That's by far not the case. But this creates, I think, a lot of problems for the sector overall because it creates a lot of mistrust, firstly, in cross-border business, which I think it, you know, it is at stake right now and we need to realize that. And secondly, of course, it, uh, it doesn't bring really good name to the insurance sector overall, because in all these situations, you know, there was some detriment to consumers at the end of the day. So my message is very clear, is we need to, within this uh, review of uh, the Solvency II framework, we need to complete the, the framework. Uh, I don't think that we need a huge overall I think that we need some fine-tuning and to put some pieces of the puzzle that are really, really missing. And I hope that we can definitely do that before we have one big company in this list and then we will have a huge crisis. And uh, as I usually say, you know, um, I believe that one day there will be centralized insurance supervision in Europe, but I would hate that that would come because of a crisis. You know, let's not wait for a crisis. Let's deal with this situation. It's more than time. Thank you. Thanks.